Okay, we'll pick up the story then. We've got two more things, blocks to do, and we'll be done with development all in one day. How about them apples? Um, never work with children or animals. Right? It applies to scientists just as much as to movie actors. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult to interpret what an, uh, something that's so removed from you is doing. Um, nevertheless, of course, we want to understand what these little squawking helpless things are doing. And the challenges that arise there are very... Uh, we can, very rich, we, we, we can learn an awful lot in general about what we're doing in the sciences of the person. So we're going to look at a, just two very uh, well-known, very influential studies, one from the 70s, one from the 80s. Uh, so they're a bit old, a bit long in the tooth now at this stage. They both focus on the emerging socialization of the infant, so on its web of relations, particularly with its mother. Um, and each of these has been seminal in that it has spawned very many derivative studies. They've also been, um, there have been many attempts to replicate the original studies, some with some success, some with others. So the, the findings of the original studies from the 70s and 80s are undoubtedly in need of a great deal of uh, revision. Um, but because of their central role, because they've been so influential, we want to have a look at them so we can, be, we can look at some of the problems that arise as we, as we turn towards infants and we want to interpret their behavior um, and to, interpret, yeah, to, to find out what it means. The first study is from the, from the 1980s. It's Murray and Thurvarton. And they had this kind of a setup, which is poorly illustrated here, in which the... This is an infant, okay? And this is a mother... Sorry for the bad drawing. Um, the infant is seated comfortably in a chair and is looking straight at a screen. It's actually looking at a one-way mirror and the screen is projected down so the picture comes on here and the infant looks at the picture as if it were here in front of them. Um, but there's a camera here which can record the infant directly. So it's, the camera is also looking directly at the infant. The mother is in a different room. And the mother is in a similar setup. And what the mother is looking at is the picture from this camera. So the mother seems to be looking at the infant. And what the infant seems to be looking at is the mother. That's the point of these two cameras. So the, to the, it's a bit like Skype. This is 1985. We didn't have Skype. Okay, so the, it looks to the child like the child is Skyping with his mom. And what happens is... Each infant was run in two sessions, usually on the same day. And in the first session, they would interact with their mother and just play games and blah, 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 whatever mothers and infants do when they're Skyping. <laughs> and then that was also recorded. And then later on in the afternoon or in the second session, the infant will be presented with a recording of the mother. This is a distinction between liveness and a recorded recording or a representation. It's a very, very interesting contrast, one that we will meet many times. And there's a single basic finding, which is that infants were very happy to interact with their mother in the live condition, and they didn't really like interacting with the recording, because they don't interact with the recording. You do something, the recording is going to do whatever it's going to do anyway. If you think in terms of stimulus and response, the stimulus is the same in both cases. The picture on the screen is the same in both cases. But in the live case, think about it. That picture is responding sensitively in real time to the activity of the kid. If the kid goes, oh, then the mother will go, oh. If the kid cries, the mother will respond. It will, they're, they're, there's a, they're backwards and forwards. They're in contact with each other in a very, very real sense. So that was nice in that it's encouraged psychologists, first of all, to stop thinking in terms of stimulus and response, because that's just not going to work here. You've got the same stimulus, but you've got very different responses. Uh, and encouraged them to look at the importance of this sense of ongoing social interaction. Um, 
but the replication proved to be a problem. Um, other studies failed to replicate the exact findings, and an awful lot of the difficulty in replication, and indeed in develop, further developing these, comes from how do you interpret infant behavior? You know, some infants are going to be quite happy sitting in front of a recording of their mother, frankly, because some infants are going to be happy in front of a recording of anything. You put them in front of a screen. It's Dora the Explorer. It's Mommy on Teddy. It's something like that. You know, they didn't all show distress just because it was a recording. What the, what the psychologists are trying to differentiate here is trying to recognize the significance of the interaction from the baby's point of view, but there's no singular measure that you can that anyone's yet successfully come up with that will capture that. So there's, the jury is still out on exactly how one should structure this. I don't think the jury is out on the basic finding. The basic finding is that, if, that the liveness of the interaction really, really matters to the child. It's the kind of thing that, as, as, a, as a, an alive, socially engaged human being, you know in advance anyway. You know the difference between reacting to a recording and a live person. Shouldn't need pointing out. Or should it? Psychology is rotten with this kind of confusion of treating recordings as if they were live things. Perhaps the most um, well-established area in visuals, um, in the cognitive psychology of vision, is in the area of face perception. In the area of face perception, there's a huge amount number of studies done, uh, done in all kinds of ways, behavioral studies, neuroimaging studies, and so on. The results have served to identify a particular part of the brain which is considered to be responsive to faces. And that information, in turn, will be used in carefully directing surgeons' knives as they attack tumors and such like. And here's a funny thing about the experimental psychology of face perception, 99.9% .9 of the cases nobody ever saw a face. All they ever saw was images of faces. So people have been quite happy to study face perception by putting people into scanners or staring at them on the screen looking at an image of a face and not a real face. Now what's the difference between an image of a face and a real face? Well, a real face can snarl at you. A real face can spit at you. You have an ethical concern with a real face. If you're facing, if I'm looking at you, I'm looking at a person, I'm not looking at a picture. But this confusion of pictures and the real thing is endemic in psychology. This is just one situation in which it's thematized, and thank heavens it has been thematized, but it needs to be thematized an awful lot more. Okay, the second one we're going to look at is older. And it's so, such a classic that many of you will have actually seen that picture. Many of you have seen that picture? Yeah, one. Okay. Melts off in Moore, 1977. The hairstyle gives it away, right? I bet he's wearing flares as well. Um, I mean, this is the Queen. Um, there were three facial gestures and two hand gestures, which these neonates, and they were very, very young, uh, they were two to three weeks old, so, sorry, basic setup is this. You get these very, very young, two to three week old infants. They're much younger than the, than the previous study. And you interact with them, make funny faces at them, wave your hands at them, and look to see what do they imitate. And these are such, you know, these infants are so young, they've never seen themselves. There's no, they've no experience of mirrors. They've never seen their own faces. Um, and the claim in this very influential paper was that there were three facial gestures and one manual gesture out of, I think, four facial and two manual that were tested, which the infants regularly and reliably imitated. The facial ones were the open mouth, that's this one, tongue protrusion, and pouting. And the manual one was finger pointing. I forget what the other manual one was. Fascinating. These little buggers have no experience of themselves, and here they are. It seems to be the basis for mimesis, the basic imitative capacity, which many people have taken to be um, a qualitative hallmark of the human that sets us, sets us apart from other animals and may be at the basis of language and culture. 
So it's an important kind of study. But there are problems with it. Um, there have been lots of attempts to replicate this, and the, the original work was very careful frame-by-frame -frame video analysis, very labor-intensive, but there was this very subjective uh, in interpretive question that was never properly solved. How do you, what exactly does a child have to do in order for it to count as an imitation? Bear in mind that these are animate beings who are doing stuff with their faces all the time and doing stuff with their hands all the time. How closely tied does it have to be in time to the gesture of the experimenter? How similar does it have to be given the different morphology? Right? The experimenter is a grown adult male and has a very different face and very different hands, very different motor skills. Um, there's been a lot of attempts to replicate this. They haven't all stood the, the test of time. The tongue protrusion is probably safe. It seems that infants will stick out their tongue when someone sticks their tongue out of them, and very young chimpanzees will do the same. Now there we've got an even bigger question of matching morphology. Um, but the jury is, it's 2016. This original study is 1977. Uh, it's still not entirely clear what is going on here. Um, what it did do was it raised an awful lot of interesting questions, which have come to be known in studies of imitation as the correspondence problem. If you have a different body to mine, and I do something, how do I interpret what you'd next do? Should I interpret it as an imitation? This is particularly acute when we come to, for example, teach dolphins tricks. If I do this, and then the dolphin takes its flippers and does that, is that an imitation? Well, that's certainly morphologically very different. Um, and that one is probably the clearest case. How do you map from one being onto another when their morphologies are so different? How closely linked do they have to be in time? How reliable does the response have to be? Bear in mind that this is as true for dolphins as it is for infants, you're not going to do the same thing if the same thing happens in the world. We are not stimulus response driven automata. If you do something and I do something, you do that thing again, I'll probably do something different the next time just because it's fun. That's true for dolphins too. So this study raised, probably raises more questions than it does provide answers. Um, in your required reading, there is a paper by a very, I think, insightful developmental psychologist, well, two, two developmental psychologists, I only know one of them personally, Vasa David Reddy from Portsmouth and Colvin Trevartan, uh, have a paper, and the question they raise really is, how objective can we be when we come to try to interpret the behavior of infants? And they say that they, uh, they wanted to show that evidence that engagement is how we gain psychological knowledge about others, and that this is, sorry, the claim is that engagement is how we do it, and that this is true for the psychologist as well, that there is not available a suitably detached stance from which you can exclude yourself from the object of your observation. When you plot the position of the stars in the sky, you don't influence the position of the stars in the sky, they go on doing what they're doing irrespective of what you do. Infants are not like that. So you are engaged, and they, the claim being made here is that it's inappropriate to pretend that you're not. When we get on to study social cognition towards the end of this class, we'll meet a very different approach to development. A psychologist who is lauded in the halls of psychology as having demonstrated uh, a lot about the necessity for love in human and in mother-infant relations and who I will characterize as a creepy git. We should not be let do experiments. Um, we'll leave Harry Harlow, is his name, to later. Um, but I want you to seriously consider the argument that Basil Debbie Reddy and Colin Trevartan are making here, which is that when you come to study individuals of your own species, is there available to you a disinterested hands-off stance, or are you necessarily engaged? And if you are, what are the consequences for your science? 
I don't have any ready-made answers, but they are very, very important questions that arise here. Okay, last I want to show you a more, much more recent work, which I think is extremely exciting as well. And anybody heard of the Human Speech Home Project? The name is riffing on the Human Genome Project, but it's not the genome. And it follows a long tradition of scientists studying their own children. So as Charles Darwin did, as Sigmund Freud did, Piaget we mentioned today. And this is Deb Roy of the MIT Media Lab, who also study his own children. So they don't belong in this ranks of evil psychologists. I don't think so. I don't see anything wrong with studying your own children. But it must be said that Deb's work has, I've seen people be quite worried in its presentation. Um, this is now a bit old, so it's 2016. This, the data collection here was 2005 to 2008. The work was done on the uh, using his first son, Brandon. Um, and the goal was nothing short of audacious. The attempt was to capture the entire linguistic output and environment of a child over three years. That means record every single word the child said in context, so you could describe the entire context, and record everything that was said in the environment of the child over three years. Small challenge. Uh, he rigged up his home with video cameras up on, at ceiling level in every room with a fisheye view of the, of the entire place. There's microphones in every room. Each room had switches, so if someone wanted something not be recorded, they could erase the last 10 seconds, minute, 10 minutes, and so on. There was an awful lot of worry about privacy concerns because we're talking about the domestic environment of Deb Roy with his wife and their son. It generated phenomenal amount of data and we're talking 11 years ago, uh, where we, they were generating 200 gigabytes a day, and this was all going down to, to the entire basement of the house, which turned into a big data collection warehouse. And that generated a, a, a logistical problem. How do you analyze data when you've got that much of it? Um, well, that's why I say it's a kind of ambitious project. Um, why do this? You remember, one of the main blows that Chomsky dealt to Skinner's account of human language was he emphasized that uh, humans acquire language despite the fact that the environment is not suitable for teaching them it from scratch. Therefore, they must be innately predispositions to learn language, that the environment is providing very, very little. That was an armchair claim, kind of pontification on the basis of zero data whatsoever, because Chomsky thought that. This is an attempt to look at that, and it's a very brave attempt. Um, this is what it looks like, this is what it looks like looking down from one room. Um, and there's lots of rooms. You're not recording from all the rooms all the time. You record from where the child is. The data are still being analyzed. Um, but there's a lot of results out of this as well. And it has given rise to other projects. Um, one of the main areas in which this research has delivered results is in the analysis of large behavioral data sets. Um, that you have to automate as much as possible. So developing algorithms that could semi-automatically or with minimal human guidance sift through the data and extract relevant pieces is a, has, has been a significant challenge that has been to some extent overcome. Um, what you can do is you can listen to things that you never heard before. You can see things you never saw before. Uh, I'm going to play you now something that was absolutely unthinkable. Every utterance of this child of the word water from the first time he produced the word until he produces an adult-like form. The initial form is something like gaga. Parents are great at knowing what kids are talking about, those in context and so on. Um, and we can extract them and we can jam, what, two years of language acquisition together and we can listen to it. And as we do so, I think Piaget would love this because what you hear is a word 
sort of growing and sprouting. Listen to this anyway, this is the word water. No, it's not, says you. We got the volume, can you have a little volume on the bloody speaker? Oh, there we go. Let's try that again. Took him a while and he got it forwards and backwards and then and he's really pleased with himself you get the impression as well i think it's beautiful data um that's just an example of what is available now that was never available before but there's something else which is you can actually test this uh, notion that the environment of the child is uh, essentially providing very little information and that the language development is coming from the inside I better explain this graph uh, a little bit. Now, you've just met the word water. The first time that word was spoken, it didn't have its usual form, but it was clearly the word for water. It was referential, it was in context, and it was gaga. So that's the first, that's the birth of that word, right? And if you don't know what a truck is, you're not gonna use the word truck unless you're in the context, unless, you know, some stage along the line, you're gonna discover trucks, and then you're gonna use the word truck. So we can call that word for each, word separately, we can call that the day of its birth. Okay, so that's T0 for the word water. And the word bread has a different T0. And the word truck has a different T0, a different birth. Yeah? Is the day of its birth when he actually says water or gaga? Gaga. Oh. Gaga. So we're not interested in the phonetic, that, the rest is just, that's fine tuning. But it's, um, we're li relying to some extent on the parental, in parental understanding of what the child is doing. So we have this engagement issue. Absolutely. And then, having identified for each word, and they did this for hundreds of words, the moment of its birth, you can look at the, there's a crude measure he developed of the complexity of the sentences used by the caregivers, that is the sentences in the environment, containing that word before and after the birth of the word. How complex is that? Now, the measure of complexity is going to be very, very simple. It's just the size of the sentence, number of words in the sentence. And this is, remember, each word has its own history. So bread appears on March 24th, and water appears eight months earlier. So we're comparing sentences containing the word water eight months ago with sentences containing the word bread in March. But we can collapse those and align them by the birth of the word, and what we see is shown over here, what you see is that the environment is in a sensitive dance with the child. That sentences containing the word that is about to be born, that has not been born yet, become progressively simpler to the point where the child starts using the word and then they get slightly more complex again. And this is happening for individual words, each on their own timetable, so nobody could possibly be conscious of this. This is not in any way under conscious control, but what it does show is that there is a sensitive mutuality to the language of the caregivers and the language of the child, which is responding sensitively to the successes of the child. As a child produces the word, there seems to be some sort of anticipation in the environment of the child producing the word, and once a child has produced the word, then we don't have to support it in that way. This looks very like an empirical counterpart of Vygotsky's zone of, uh, what's it called? Uh, zone of proximal development. Proximal development, sorry. Brain for you. Name one world leader. <laughs> um, so it's a really, really intriguing uh, example. When you have a data set this rich, you've got to ask yourself, what can we do with it? And the answer is not clear. We don't really know. Here, for example, we just listen to audio samples of the word water. We can also do audio visual sampling and we can look at what the, 
Where are people? In what room are words being used? What's going on as the word is used? So here's audiovisual sampling of the word ball, and I don't know what to make of it. data that no developmental psychologist ever had available to them. Um, and there's stuff coming out of it maybe that we wouldn't have expected. One thing you can look at is um, in what context do words appear? Where does the word water happen? Where does the word duck happen? And what you find is that there is a lexical geography to the, to the environment of the child. So you can, use, you can look at what, where words happen, when they happen, and what are the other words that are being used around that time. So we, we can look separately at the spatial context, the temporal context, and the linguistic context. And what you find is that the more specific a word is, to a given context, the easier it is to learn. So if the word always happens at the front door, that's a really useful kind of clue. It shows that the language is not free-floating. The language is tied to the activities in the house, to the spatial layout of the house, and to the passage of night and day. So they have separate predictors based on where words are used, when the words are used, and what are the other words that are being used, each of these is a kind of a context, and the more specific the context was, the easier the word was to learn. Just to show you what kind of things we've got over here on the left-hand side is a map of the house reproduced. Red is an area where the word is used predominantly. Blue is an area where it's not likely to be used. The second word down is breakfast. You can see the red. Clearly, breakfast is tied to a particular place. So this word is going to be obligatorily associated with the kitchen. And it's a very unusual place to have the word car, for example. Here you've got um, passage over time. This is the temporal predictor. And the gray thing shows you just for all the words generally. There's more words produced in the early. So there's kind of a, a bump in the morning and a bump in the early evening where there's more words. But here you can see some words are sticking out. They're much more likely to happen at specific times than others. No big surprise that breakfast is not only tied to a particular place, but breakfast is tied to a particular time. But I have no idea why the word fish is tied to a particular time, but it sure as hell is. Mm -hmm. In this house, for these people, I mean, we all have our specifics, right? In this house, for this child, fish is going to be tied to a particular time. And there's a kind of words, so here are the Lexical items, um, it's, there's some rather a, a set of words which are not used very frequently, but which, if fish is in play, are quite likely to be used. Fish is one of them, turtle, cat, hat, crab. You can see a bunch of ideas lexically. So if you're talking about crabs, it's quite likely the word fish is going to turn up, right? Even though you don't talk about crabs very often. So these are spatial, temporal, and lexical or linguistic predictors. Sometimes it's very, very strong. Look at that second one down there is kick. That's the hallway and going out towards the front of the house. That's where the word kick is used. Kick is used in very specific situations. Whereas the word with down here has no particular spatial layout, no geography, is used equally of, uh, likely at any, uh, so it's, it's completely undifferentiated with respect to the word set generally. And it's not, so it's not used at any particular time, and it's not used with any particular word. So that it matches the distribution of with matches the distribution of all the other words, which means with is going to be a really hard word to learn. Right? Breakfast is going to be a really easy word to learn. With is going to be a hard word to learn. 
So what we have here is something quite unique. We have the direct observation of the linguistic environment of the child. They reckoned that, I mean, the child wasn't in the house the whole time. So there's some missing, but they reckon they missed no more than 15%, which given that the previous prior art had zero, is a pretty damn good stat. Um, and it shows that the simplicity of the poverty of the stimulus argument by Chomsky can be challenged, and it can be challenged empirically. It shows that language learning is really, really interesting. It's tied to places, practices, activities. It's going to be unique for each child is going to encounter a different spatial layout, a different set of timings associated with words, different sets of associations, lexical associations with words. A child learning language in this household is going to be in a different situation to a child learning language in this household. It showed that we can differentiate between words which stand out and words which are going to be quite difficult to learn. Not all words are equal. And the situation certainly is nowhere near as simple as one might have thought. So I think it's rather good work. The I'm, I'm going to respond. I saw some of you grimacing there, the, the thought of doing this to your child. I know that personally. I've spoken to him and his wife, and I'm perfectly happy with this work. Um, Brandon is now in his teens. Um, he's as well as been first author in a lot of papers. Um, the data set is protected. It's not shared with other people. There is the he has the right to to um, pull back any published results uh, should he wish to at any stage. Um, there hasn't been any problem with this. Um, they did. Dev and his wife went on and had another kid, and they decided not to do this again, <laughs> which is perhaps not surprising. Um, uh, and no study in MIT has received more scrutiny from an ethical point of view than this one. Um, so I think we can take this as no babies were harmed in the making of this experiment. Uh, on the other hand, this shows a sort of a selflessness and devotion that I certainly wouldn't be. I, I would not have this done in my house. So. Yeah.